of Crime War, another edition of Crime War, and it's uh, with the great network of crime reporters around the world we're in contact with. It's fantastic to talk to Nicola Talent, the crime editor of the Sunday World in Dublin, Ireland, who's been working on an amazing story, an incredible global crime story, which amid the pandemic and the protests hasn't really got it deserves. It involves Irish gangsters, cocaine trafficking, the biggest boxing fight in history, Tyson Fury, uh, United States, Middle East, everything you can imagine. This story's got everything. Uh, and Nicola Talent has been on this case for years and kind of braving, covering Irish gangsters, Irish cocaine traffickers for some time. So, so great to talk to you again, uh, Nicola. And so to get the beginning of this story, um, I mean, first, how long have you been covering this um, Kinahan cartel? Is that the correct way to call this, this gang? Uh, you know, how do you call it? Yeah, they are called that. I mean, in 2010, there was a big arrest in Spain on the Costa del Sol, where they were then based. And at the time, the Guarda Seville came out and they called them the Irish Mafia. So mm. they would have been basically the first Irish crime group to make it that far up the ladder of organised crime. Before that, we certainly had other individuals who left these shores, went to Europe and, and became very significant. But this was an actual mafia down on the costa, rivaling those of, of you know, the Spanish, the, the Colombians, the Moroccans, the Eastern Europeans that are all down there. Um, so that was back in 2010. So obviously it took some time to build that mafia. Um, and it probably was about 10 years in the in the making down there. I've been covering it for too long, really, 15, nearly maybe 20 years, showing my age. But Yeah, the like, same as me. It's weary stuff. I've been here 20 years now in Mexico and covering, yeah. covering crime here. So to, to, for a lot of people um, who follow this, uh, you know, know, are familiar with Mexican organized crime and things happening in the United States. But uh, Ireland's a kind of faraway place. Uh, and to kind of understand the dynamics of this, so you have um, in Spain a lot of organised crime in Spain, and Spain is the gateway for cocaine coming into Europe. Is that what they're involved in and, and kind of what they're playing in? Yeah, Spain, the Costa del Sol, be kind of came a traditional base for gangsters back in the 1980s. Spain had no extradition treaty with the UK. So a lot of the UK gangsters went on the run, went down to Spain. They liked the weather. They liked the food and also its geographical location. You can see Morocco in the distance sometimes if it's a clear day. Um, you know, it's an ideal landing base into Europe. Europe's cocaine market, I think, is, 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 is not quite as big as the US. But nonetheless, it's a growth market and it has been growing and growing for years um, and continues to do so. There's still some left. It's not quite at saturation yet. So Spain is a very significant area in Europe for gangsters. And the other area would be Holland. And mm. Holland is sort of known as the supermarket of drugs. They, the Dutch have quite a lax attitude to things. Um, and whether that had anything to do with it or basically the port of Rotterdam would be probably one of the biggest entry points into Europe and, and, and tens and thousands of containers going through it every day. It's, it's again, another ideal port to land um, drugs into Europe. And obviously, when you come into Europe, you have loads of land borders and then you have to cross the sea to get to England and cross the sea again to get to small little Ireland where uh, all the trouble began when, um, when Christy Kinahan known now as the Dapper Don, um, left here probably around 2000, having served some time in jail. He was convicted of, uh, of he had a heroin conviction here, other money laundering convictions, that kind of thing. He would have been a criminal who is unusual in that he was educated in middle class and mm. chose crime all his contemporaries that came up in Ireland here around the 80s. And they would have had to be quite tough because they were emerging criminal gangs that were, for the first time, um, you know, we have had the IRA, which has been the army here, who has fought in the north 
against the, against British control over the north of Ireland. There have been over the time we call the Troubles, three thousand deaths, murders. Um, so they were a very significant force to come up against, and and those early drug dealers and drug gangs that started coming up had to kind of face them down somewhat and maybe come to a business arrangement. Um, they would have paid paid off the IRA to allow them operate. So they were certainly um, so, so, know, so, formidable. So, formidable. So, so Christy Kinnahan was a middle class guy, you're saying, or was a working class guy who was quite educated? Or what was his background? Yeah, actually, he was totally middle class, which is really right. unusual. For all the time I have covered um, gangsters and, and yeah. gangland crime, there's very, very few people like Christy Kinnahan you can find within it. He was from a middle class area of, of North County Dublin. The family lived in a very big luxury red brick period property. His mm. mother ran a bed breakfast from the property and his father was a taxi driver on a, a rank in town. So very middle class. He's two sisters, one of whom um, got involved in trade unions and is quite well known, has absolutely nothing to do with him. And another sister also got involved in, in sort of being a spokesperson for the taxi industry. Um, so, you know, he had choices in life. He was the only boy in the household. He was very spoiled. He was extremely uh, fit. He was a mm. champion kickboxer himself. Oh, and really? okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, he would have been quite a handsome, good looking guy. Um, and yeah. he was kind of coming to adulthood at a time that Dublin was becoming ravaged by a heroin epidemic. Um, now, now so, so, I mean, you know, I, I grew up near Brighton and there was plenty of middle class drug dealers there, um, uh, you know, and, and, and there was private school kids who got into drug dealing. It, it, was, it was not a surprise. Normally, though, they do it for a while. And, and then when they kind of when it gets serious and there's serious prison time they're looking at or, or the stakes get more serious is when often they'll back away and, you know, and try and get into a career. But he carried on. So, so he got, you know, he was, was he, was he a, a significant drug dealer in Dublin? You know, he became, before he went off to Spain? Yes, he was, because there was this heroin epidemic and mm. there was one major dealer here called Larry Dunn, Flash Larry, they used to call him. And Larry Dunn got nabbed and he was jailed. And, and when he went, there was a vacuum left and there was a couple of characters that were, really ready to, to pounce and get in and take his market. And Christy Kinahan was one of them. A surprise, you know, person to get involved in at all, given his middle, middle class background. He was jailed, I think, for eight or nine years for heroin trafficking. But the minute he went into jail, um, he started to study foreign languages and used his time to make contacts and, you know, to make partnerships. And in particular, he made one very... Um, lifelong partnership, another criminal called John Cunningham, who'd been involved in numerous kidnaps, etc. So when they both got out, they headed straight to Holland. They set up a wholesalers back into Ireland and and then into the UK. And between the two of them, they seemed to go in and out of jail quite often, but never at the same time. So they kind of managed to somebody was always out to look after business. And they built up this cartel, which they, they, they started in Holland, moved it down to Spain. And really by 2002, Christy Kinahan was on the brink of something in the south of Spain. Um, he was lucky because on top of his own prowess in business, and he had earned the, the nickname of the Dapper Don at this stage because he, had, he spoke numerous languages he had this sort of mid-Atlantic accent gone, was any Dublin tones that he, he once had. And he was educated in everything from green energy to, you know, you name it, any course he could have done in, in, in jail, he did it. But 2002 down in Spain, you had Europe beginning to open up. It was growing. The European Union was all about opening borders, you know, trade, increasing trade, bringing in new countries from outside. But law enforcement didn't move as quickly as that. It stayed behind and there was absolutely very difficult to get cooperation between the law enforcement in the different jurisdictions. So while Kinahan and his likes was able to very easily move, transport, organise his logistics 
and grow law enforcement was was kind of like you know left behind and it took them nearly 10 years to catch up on the growth of Europe and to start cooperating properly um, so, so so he at this point and, and I don't want to you know say things that which haven't been like proven in court in terms of his crimes but uh, at this point were they importing cocaine and, and distributing cocaine to Ireland to England is that what the, the kind of main racket they were involved in <laughs> Most certainly. So by 2010, this Operation Shovel, which was the Spanish-led um, multi-agency offensive against the Kinahan cartel, at that point they called them the Mafia. They had become a Mafia. There was a lot of surveillance and, and a lot of behind-the-scenes investigation in the years leading up to the arrests on Shovel. And what they discovered was that they were dealing directly with the Colombians, Mm. They were having conversations about actually buying a container ship so as they could cut out the middleman. So they'd just buy their own to import the cocaine into Europe. They were bringing heroin in. They were bringing cannabis in from North Africa. And they were dealing what they called in a one-stop stop, one stop shop for criminals. So if you went to them, you could buy your weapons from them. You could buy your drugs for them. And they also had a money laundering wing. So you could go back with your wealth and they'd give you a hand washing it. So they were they were a big industry at that stage. Um, they so were able to. This is pretty yeah. significant. I mean, this is like in terms of you know, cause a lot of time, you know, British gangsters or Irish gangsters are pretty low level. It's kind of in some ways a kind of myth always looking for these figures. But there are a few characters who really stand out there and get to that level. And it sounds like Christy Kinahan was one. He was. And, and on, the, on the laundering side of things, like that was 2010. So they've, they've mm. grown ever since, by the way, even though this was supposed to have been the end of them. Mm. They had bought a corner of Brazil. Mm. Um, the... the uh, the, Brazil, the Brazilian coast known as like the Riviera or whatever, really, really nice part of the coast. And they had bought a corner of the of the properties there. And what they were going to do was build a huge big country club, holiday homes. There was to be 300 or 400 um, high class houses. There was hotels. There was this, that and the other on it. And they were developing that and selling it um, to European customers. And it was all part of their, their money laundering. But they're, they put a figure on them at the time of the, the cartel worth as being one billion then. And, and you know, wow. these figures are, <laughs> there's so many zeros after them. You just can't get your head around them, can you? No, no, no um, that's quite incredible to get to that level. I mean, yeah, I mean, as you say, the European cocaine market is very significant. Um, you know, it might even be rivaling or bigger than the United States. We don't really know. And, and people paying in euros and cocaine is more expensive. Mm. Apparently, the biggest consumer countries are England, Spain, and Italy are the the big <laughs> the biggest cocaine. Yes, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Certainly, in, in Ireland, uh, there's, there's cocaine being used as well. So now, what's Christie's status now? Is he currently serving time in prison? No, he's not. So he has been in and out, as I said, of prison on various things. The Belgians investigated him for money laundering around then 2010, mm -hmm. shortly after he'd been brought before the Spanish courts on money laundering charges. He served a sentence in Belgium. He served time in prisons in, in Holland. Um, and always quite short terms. And some of the European countries, nothing tallies when it comes to sentences here. But uh, he basically wanted to retire. I think he probably had almost moved to legitimate businessman at that stage. Mm. And, you know, he was traveling around the world and... and um, his plan was always he'd brought two of his sons with him that had been born and, and reared here in Dublin in a working class um, ha, uh, uh, flat complex because Christy Kinahan, despite his middle class background, had had fallen for um, a cleaning lady from the Oliver Bond flat complex, mm. had then gone into jail and the two kids had been reared by her on their own. But he brought them out to Spain as teenagers and he taught them the ropes. And in 2014, he handed over um, in and around that point, we, we, we think he handed over the reins of his cartel to his son, Daniel. Uh, Daniel so, is 42 years of age now, so he would have been in his late 30s. 
go back a second. So mm. Daniel and his brother grew up on a counter estate in, yeah. in, in, in Dublin um, while their father was in prison. And then they go off when they're teenagers to this dad who's come out of prison and become this rich multimillionaire. Um, you know, quite a change of fortunes. And so you have the situation where he's grown up um, in, a, in a fairly tough environment, Daniel Kinahan, and he's then surrounded by wealth. Now, was he into boxing as a kid? Is, is he a lifelong, is he a boxer himself? Well, he, he certainly likes to, to, to think he is. Whether he boxed as a kid, he probably did, to be honest with you, because that would be the, the kind of the main sport in the area where he grew up. And um, he moved out to Spain and he, he knew he was inheriting this cartel, but he had another dream, which was to make it big, big, big in boxing. Um, he opened a gym in, 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 down in the Costa del Sol in around 2012, 2013, and called it MGM. He opened mm. it along with a boxer friend of his called Matthew Macklin, who was quite a famous English boxer. Um, and they basically opened this gym and sort of brought along celebrity fighters to come and train and that they'd kind of give them, you know, six weeks over the summer, they'd put them up in very fancy houses down around there and, and bring them into this very nice gym and train them up and all the rest of it. And Daniel Kinahan, while nobody really noticed it, had massive dreams for himself within that world. Mm. He was kind of um, more famous really for being his father's son and the, the, the head of this of this massive big criminal mob on, on the Costa. And in a way, even people who were watching them closely, my, my, like myself, were inclined to think that the boxing was a hobby for Daniel. It took me a while to realise where he was going with it. He had this gym in, in, in Port of Benus and he used to put on these white collar events and, and he'd fight himself in the ring. Now, everybody mm. cheered for him, whether he did well or not, you know. <laughs> and he seemed to always be the champion at the end of it. But, you know, he was bringing celebrity boxers over to those. They were supposed to be raising money for charities. Um, more and more, you started seeing kind of well-known boxers from the UK and from, from, from Ireland signing up to the, the, um, the gym. And it became a, a proper boxing promotions firm. Um, and then, of course, in 2016... Sorry, so once... One second, just to, to get back into such a mm. crazy, sprawling story. Um, Daniel Kinahan, so he, he has not been arrested himself. He has not been or has not been in, imprisoned or charged with anything himself. But, he was actually arrested in 2010 in Spain during Operation Shovel. He was brought before the courts mm. and the charges are still there. It okay. works in a very strange way in Spain. The magistrates investigate and it can go on for years. Um, but he has no convictions, no serious convictions, and no convictions here in Ireland. Right, okay, no convictions. So now he is, but you know for a fact that the European police and Irish police and Spanish police uh, are investigating him, him and looking at him. So Daniel Kinahan has been named in the High Court here in Ireland on a number of occasions as being the head of the Kinahan Organised Crime Group which they are now called. They're recognised by Europol and have featured in the Europol reports. Europol is the united police force, basically, of Europe. Um, he has been named in the Special Criminal Court in Ireland during a, an attempted murder case, again, as being the head of the Kinahan Organised Crime Group, which have been named in court during evidence in court as being a murderous mob involved mm. in, a, in a big feud here in Ireland for the last four years. And he's also been named in Spain. Um, basically, a fight broke out within his mob and it divided and a former friend and colleague of his was murdered. When the perpetrator of that murder, James Quinn, was brought before the courts in Spain, he was convicted of murdering that, that, that individual, Gary Hutch. And it was said in court that Daniel Kinnan had directed that murder. So while he has no convictions, he has been very much named in in courts of law um, throughout Europe as being the head of, of the, the KOCG, as they're now called, 
um, as recognised now as as the Jalisco cartel or, or you know, the Kinahan name on this side of the world is is known. Right. Um, it, 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 so it's certainly, certainly in Dublin. So, it, so inside Dublin, you say there's been these kind of turf war fighting out. Is that for, you know, what are they fighting over and what level of violence are we talking about? Well, well, in 2016, Daniel brought his boxing dream home to Dublin to um, he was going to put on a big boxing sort of extravaganza in the in the national stadium here. And there had been rumblings that there was a feud going on within the gang. I think his elevation to boss uh, didn't go sort of without causing some jealousies within the gang. He had brought a lot of his childhood friends from from Dublin, from the streets of Dublin with him into the, the heart of his father's cartel. And a lot of the guys might have been a bit tougher than him or had to, you know, fight their way up rather than be gifted it. So there was a lot of a lot of kind of jealousies about his status and, and that he had been sort of born with a silver spoon in his mouth, albeit in the underworld. Um, but he came home to Dublin to to show the you know the city what he had become in boxing. He was a you know a big manager, a big promoter. And during the way in there was a shooting and uh, it was staged by the half that were jealous of him. We call him the hutch faction of his mob. And the target was him. It was an assassination attempt on him himself. Um, it failed miserably. He got away and another friend died on the in the reception of the hotel. Um, the whole event was videoed. It was not that long after the Bataclan in, in, in Paris, which again, mm. I suppose we saw on video and audio heard it. And so it became a major big deal and it was it broadcast across the world and, and um, Daniel Kinahan kind of became a household name for all the wrong reasons. He was mm. wanting it to be for his boxing prowess. So since then, that feud has gone on and there is 20 people dead in Dublin alone, most of them victims from the, uh, the side that went against the Kinahans. But uh, nonetheless, he has had to step back from his boxing promotions company because of all the bad publicity he's got uh we were told he'd sold it off so so one, one second because i want to get get into the whole boxing thing in a second but just to get a sense of this violence so 20 murders that's pretty significant for for a european city um unfortunately here in mexico <laughs> we, that's like I, that's like you know, we get in a morning across mexico but like a, right. but, uh, uh, but 20 murders now are we talking about shooting, stabbings? What kind of form are the murders committed? All professional assassinations on the streets of Dublin and mostly within a small north inner city community, which would have been the stronghold of the Hutch faction, which had sort of challenged them. Um, very dirty, dirty uh, war and nothing like it has been seen in Europe because I don't know what things are like in Mexico, but certainly Europe wise and certainly in England and Ireland, there was this sort of old school um, code really for, for, for gangsters. And they, they would have shot at one another perhaps, but there would have always been a sense that you, you didn't go for the families or for innocent family members. But um, the gloves came off with this feud uh, and there have been, there have been five, six innocent family members targeted. Very easy pickings. Uh, brothers, friends uh, of the, the the main protagonist against Kinahan. And it's been dirty, uh, really, really dirty. And um, there have been innocent people shot, caught in the crossfire. Um, it's been certainly one of the most uh, vicious feuds we've seen in that it's mainly those murders happened within an 18-month period, which is a lot for a European city, as you say, and Dublin has a population of one million people. So it was a lot and nearly all concentrated on friends and associates, and members of the one family. Um, I mean, I mean, and this is stuff you, you really have to watch because you see the way in Latin America, the way that you let these murders get out of hand, think, OK, whatever, and then it carries on and on. And then this is how societies start to fall apart. 
because then murder becomes common and people get used to it and get away with it. And so that's, you know, that's why it's so important to keep looking at these stories because, you know, you can't take this stuff for granted. Um, and, it, you know, and, you know, this is, you know, it really gets, you know, you see how bad society gets hurt when murders become so rampant and just keep on going. So, but anyway, so at what point did Daniel then move to Dubai? So he supposedly sold his company and mm. they made a public statement that he'd step back because of the negative publicity and that he didn't want, um, you know, to damage the boxers. He wanted this company to do really well. So he moved to Dubai, like m within months of that um, assassination attempt on him um, in the Regency Hotel. Certainly within 12 months of that, he moved out to Dubai, left his gym behind him. And um, it was around that time, actually, that Tyson Fury begins training in the gym. Um, Tyson Fury ha is a huge character in boxing. Mm -hmm. um, he had been doing extremely well, but had, uh, had, had won a fight, was supposed to do a comeback, and had seemed to got lost in, in, a, in a haze of drugs, alcohol, and bipolar depression. Mm. Um, had gained weight, he's a heavyweight, but he had gained, they talked between 26 and 30 stone he was up to. He was mm. drinking, um, he was drinking tequila for his breakfast and eating fast food all day and, and was lost nearly mm. as a sportsman completely. Um, you know, his former manager even says now he was also up to his eyeballs in debt and was being dragged before the courts by everybody and, and very outspoken guy and was being criticized for being homophobic and, you know, racist. And every time he opened his mouth, he was in trouble and yeah. he looked as if he was really washed up. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I must say, I love, I loved, I loved Tyson Fury as a fighter. I, I mean, I loved his comeback um, and, and I loved this spirit of, of somebody coming back and, and, and winning that. And, and, I, and I, you know, uh, Forgive his, uh, you know, forgive some of his kind of rantings as being, a, um, you know, a guy who's uh, gone through hard times. Actually, you know, I, I don't mind his talking about Jesus and God, you know, in today's world. I think that's not a bad, a bad thing. But we, was Tyson Fury, did he become friends with Daniel Kinahan? Are they kind of in the same circles or how, what's their relationship? Yeah, well, I mean, all along, I suppose, when he started, when he signed up to MTK initially and he went out to Spain for this recovery. You know, mm -hmm. the first time actually you see him out in Spain, he's running through uh, a, a, a street fountain thing and he's 26 stone and it's not a good look. And mm -hmm. he's out there and he's sweating and it's night time. And you just did look at him at the time and go, seriously, has someone actually put some money into this guy? Is it possible? And then within a year, he's lost 10 stone and he's back on his feet. And, you know, he was. It was a miracle comeback. But he, the only thing since we got that, well, obviously he was linked to MTK, which Daniel Kinahan had founded. But mm. Tyson Fury released a selfie of, of himself with Kinahan mm. just around the time that he signs up to MTK. And then we hear nothing until mm. in the recent weeks, Tyson Fury announced on Instagram in a video that he was, that this fight had come off. Himself and Anthony Joshua were going to meet in the, clash of all clashes the historic um you know boxing bout and as he's you know his manic grin across the screen he, the first thing he practically says is he wants to give a shout out and thank daniel kinahan for organizing it all and there was right. this sort of gasp certainly here in ireland that i mean i have to say as a journalist i always knew kinahan was where he was he was on the outskirts he was certainly still involved in boxing but I don't think anyone really paid much heed to it. You know, sometimes it takes a celebrity to do something or say something for everybody to sit up and go, is that actually true? But <laughs> yeah, so he, um, he named him. And um, within a few days, there, the story that had been kept in Ireland all along about Daniel Kinahan had become something that was far more interesting globally and in the UK and... and um, you know, Kinahan has has uh, sort of been outed in in areas he never thought he would as as being um, 
this this international, this criminal that's wanted on, on serious organised crime charges. Now, so to get into this this whole fight, I mean, you know, crazy stuff. So you've got this this guy who survived an attempted assassination, Daniel Kinahan, and goes off to Dubai, which is a kind of haven for gangsters, would you say, Dubai? Yeah, a lot, a lot of suspect characters are there. It does appear to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A- it does appear to be. Um, the Emirates is a bit strange. They don't like to be seen as a place where they are a haven for gangsters, and yet they clearly are. Um, Sometimes the police will will move in waves against them. In the last two weeks, I don't know whether you've noticed or not, but they've handed back drug dealers to Australia, to India, and then to a number of European countries, all wanted on charges relating to organised crime. They seem to round them up every now and then and very publicly Mm -hmm. give them back, despite there Mm -hmm. being no extradition treaties, because, of course, that's why Kinahan is in Dubai, because we have no extradition treaty with them, nor does England or Spain, um, and nor will we, because to have that, we'll have to then give them back, and there's no way anybody is going into uh, is going to be handed over to a country that can jail people for holding hands on the street or drinking alcohol. Um, right. Now, now, what? Why do you think that the Irish police or the Spanish police have not? Um, issued more serious charges for Daniel Kinahan? Well, see, they can't actually get at him where he is. He hasn't left the Emirates since 2017 when he went over there. Um, He has remained there and he's sort of out of reach for the moment. Now, there have been negotiations ongoing. Um, I know there's been a delegation have gone over from Europe to the Emirates. They've met with the authorities there and the police there. And... I would certainly, from my contacts who've always proved good, I would always have been told along the way there was a massive offensive launched against the Kinahan cartel in 2016. There was a three-year plan to d- demolish them basically here in Ireland. But the international plan was always going to be longer. It was a five to six-year plan because of the use of international, co- you know, you need his cooperation. Irish Guardi could not police out to Spain and they needed cooperation, etc. But I am told and assured that it will, what has started, will be completed. And um, I certainly believe that Daniel Kinnan will be before the courts here in Ireland if he's not killed by his enemies before the law catches up with him. You know, as is the way. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you're from in the world, if you're in that, you know, if you're, if you're living in that world, that's how it is, isn't it? Okay, so there's so, so some harsh, harsh words there. So, so getting on to this fight. So um, his organization has, his, his boxing organization has set up various professional fights. Has it before? Is it, you know, like kind of not really big names, but kind of has, you know, he says it's got a gym where it trains amateur boxers. and, and Yeah, well, I'll chance. tell you, it, it's probably the biggest boxing promotions company in the world now. MTK, it has grown at a phenomenal rate. Um, it's put on shows in Madison Square Gardens and it's made links with top ranked promotions in Vegas, which is run by Bob mm-hmm. Aram, probably the most powerful boxing promoter in the world, who's 88 and one day will indeed have to retire. But mm-hmm. um, MTK is huge now and MTK now is based in Dubai as well, um, ironically and coincidentally. Now the- there's a kind of separation with M. So, so Daniel Kinahan is not officially now MTK. MTK is a separate organisation. Is that correct? Well, we were told uh, officially that it was sold. A businesswoman bought it, that he had taken a step back. He wanted the boxers to do well, but the negative publicity about him, he was stepping back, he was stepping back, nothing to do with it. And we were told that for years until the announcement by Tyson Fury at which point MTK themselves, their CEO, said, actually, yeah, he does advise some of our boxers. Um, he doesn't get paid. He does it for free. There's no financial arrangement. And he introduced MTK to Bob Aram and, and Top Rank, who will be putting on the Anthony Joshua Tyson Fury fight next year. A bit complex no. the way boxing works, I have to say, but then I'm not... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's complex. Totally. The way any any of these modern businesses work is very hard to get your head around. 
Now, with, well, what are the numbers on the fight? Do, do, we, do we have a date for the fight? Is it is like next summer or, or when's it going to be? It's, it, it's next year and, and it will be probably what they're calling the biggest purse ever. Um, yeah. There's all sorts of figures being thrown around. Um, 200 million per fight. There'll be, it's, a two, it's a two fight deal. Um, it's pay per view. So you're talking certainly 500 million in and around, they reckon, for that. Like, it, this is mega. This is absolutely yeah. mega. When you look back at, um, in the US, when, when Sammy the Bull Gravano was brought in to give testimony to the senators after he had turned Turk on John Gotti, and he was giving testimony about the interest of organised crime in boxing, and he talked about they'd lost interest for a while because the purses weren't big enough. But they were back in the game, you know, in 1993, that the purses could be anything up to $500,000. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure the mob would be interested now, you know, with the purse gone up to $200 million, you Yeah, know, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling figures for, for a sport. Now... But it's entertainment, isn't it? I mean, that's what it is. Yeah, it's yeah. a sport, but it's, it's such a show. And, it's, and look, yeah. Tyson Fury with the crown on his head and the, and the red, yeah. you know, gown around him. He's a showman. He is amazing. He's absolutely an incredible showman and yeah. celebrity. And he's so entertaining and all the rest of it. But, and look, boxing has always had a bit of whiff of sulfur about it. There's always been, as I say, the mob and everybody has been interested and involved in it over the years. But I suppose having somebody as, uh, as, as, suspected of being such a major uh, figure in such an enormous um, criminal organization involved in actually organizing it at that level is is a frightening prospect really this isn't somebody who's yeah. who's got ownership of one but this is somebody who's actually looking at I mean he's the guy that Bob Aram has called out he's the guy that Tyson Fury has called out he is the main man Bob Aram has called him the captain, Daniel Kinahan. So this is a, a, a different arena for boxing and, and organised crime. And, and it just shows as well that kind of general tolerance, um, you know, how much can they get away with allowing this kind of stuff in? What would you like to see? I mean, would you like to see a, a kind of clear denunciation so that they say, OK, we're, we're going to do the fight as a company, but we're not involved with... Daniel Kinnan, or, or, or you know, what's what's the boundaries here? Because it is murky when you've got a guy who hasn't whatever you're saying that they want to press charges, or they've named him in the high court that they haven't specifically laid out these charges against him. So, uh, and and also, it's kind of tragic to say, but for some people, actually, it's kind of it actually brings more glamour to the whole fight. It's like people are going to be like talking about it, like, oh wow, the Tyson Fury fight. And that gangster, Daniel, mm. you know, you know, are we giving more advertising by talking about this stuff? Are we actually giving more advertising to the whole event? So, so what are the boundaries do you think that we need here? And I think, you know, we lose, you know, I was, you know, covering gangsters, I get, you know, concerned about this kind of weird cross into entertainment in various spheres. I mean, yeah. when, when the wife of Chapa Guzman appeared on this reality show in Miami called Cartel Crew. And they're kind of like, it's like, you know, what's that about? And suddenly like, they're all like, you know, like sunbathing on yachts and stuff. And it's like everyone watching that as glamour and entertainment when you see in Mexico fields of bodies here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are the boundaries we need to try and establish here? I mean, as societies, we're pretty lost in a whole bunch of ways. Um, There's a huge disconnect, isn't there? Like, you know, yeah. there definitely is. And even down to, you know, the middle class businessmen, Mm. In Dublin, um, you know, complaining about the common criminals that sell drugs and yet they go out, he goes out at the weekend and he puts his hand in his pocket and spends 100 quid on coke. Mm. Like there is a disconnect. Um, funny enough, this whole thing has slightly backfired on Tyson Fury and Daniel Kinahan because since he was called out by Tyson Fury and named publicly, um, there have been significant developments the first being a company in Bahrain with which was owned by the royal family who had linked in with Daniel Kinahan 
they have dropped him. They've said they, they won't have any more to do with him. They're, they're disconnecting totally from him. And also, uh, in, in the last two days, Bob Arum of Top Rank Promotions in Vegas, himself, who had sang up Kinahan and said he was a great guy, has now said they've cut him from the fight. He's gone. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to say, as an old cynic who's been covering this for just too long, probably for my own good, I'd be very sceptical that that's the case. I'd say he's probably stepping back into the shadows again in the same way he did when he was gr- when, when this, this Tyson Fury comeback was was being was growing um, I don't believe they, they are really cutting cutting their cloth with him um, given how important he is in the negotiations but nonetheless you know it's it, it's all a message isn't it so they, they, they feel that they've said he's no longer involved so the, the, the game will go ahead in the end of the day the only interest is in the money and in that in that boxing uh you know, extravaganza going ahead. That's mm. what anybody, anybody with with some skin in the game wants because there's a hell of a lot of money um, at stake there. Now, is there an argument that, like, what these gangsters do um, in terms of their crimes, they, you know, they, they need to be prosecuted for by police and courts. But what they do outside of that and if they are doing something like providing a gym for young people to box and get off the street um, or, you know, involved in, in, in some other businesses of sport, is that something that we, sh- we can accept? It's like sometimes you get gangsters who afterwards repent and make a film or talk about their things or have a role in society. I mean, is that a boundary we can have there, do you think? Or, or, or Well, I, don't, I think I think if they repent perfectly you know and they actually have and and they want to give back i I, absolutely no problem with that in actual fact there are probably people that kids will listen to Mm. certainly a hundred million times more than they would me because Mm. they can't connect with me but i do think when they're actively involved in drug supply and and in running criminal organizations i think it's really wrong that they're involved Mm. in a sport and a sport particularly like boxing which is traditionally working class it's mm. it's a real sport that talks to kids that are, you know, growing up. And not all of them are going to be champions, but some of them will get something from sport, a discipline, you know, a, 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 an older person who will be a mentor to them, somebody who will direct them in life, whatever it is they get, even fitness. Um, and I think it's wrong that we're trying to promote sport, you know, to help kids find a way uh, and then they're being led straight into the lion's den because there's no doubt that certainly in, 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 in some boxing, in some places, kids are boxing. I think they've been trained up as a little army for these drug dealers. I mean, you know, certainly um, from stories I have written in the past, I can trace enforcers, hitmen back to, they are, they are groomed nearly within within the sport of boxing as young children. Yeah. I think that, that was the, the tradition in some of the, the the English kind of crime families was all based around boxing gyms and yes. Yeah, like, like that 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 kind of thing. Um here here in Mexico the boxers they I mean they they hang around with some of the narcos. I mean Julio Cesar Chavez in Sinaloa he says, you know, he's met all these narcos you know, he just says, I, I'm, I'm in Sinaloa, I know these guys. And there's, but then again, they're, you know, boxers are doing their thing and, and, and they don't need to uh, have boxers firing the AK 47s. Um, now, talking about the drug problem itself in, in Dublin, um, h- how bad is it? You know, heroin is obviously the, 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 the big one, a lot of problem with heroin issues or island generally, but how bad is it? How many people are dying of overdoses or how many families are suffering? from really bad addiction in Ireland. Yeah, well, there's a certain, like, I mean, heroin seems to have, like, heroin is the 24-7 drug, isn't it? I mean, people are going to get up out of wherever to go buy it. So if you were going to be a drug dealer, it's probably the really, you know, the one to go for. But mm. cocaine actually is the big growth here in mm. Ireland. I mean, it is, it is, you know, still in parts of rural Ireland that appear quaint, even when you're you're living in Dublin. They just... You know, there's the local village and a little pub and there's that whole sense of the pint of Guinness and the fire lit and, and um, you'd be lucky 
if you got a, a sandwich or whatever, but there's a sense of community spirit that's centered around those tradi traditional pubs. They're part of really what attracts tourists to Ireland. But um, in the last, you know, decades, really, you know, it's sad to see that Coke has become standard in even the likes of those. It's just mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, it's completely and utterly seeped into rural Ireland. Um, the gangs have all made connections with one another and, and beyond abroad and have their own supply routes. And, um, you know, a lot of them are supplying the north of Ireland here as well and into England. And oh, it's just it, it, it just seems everybody's using Coke. I mean, it's like, you know, you go into a pub in Dublin and, and people are, you know, taking a line of Coke in the loo as quick as they'll order a gin and tonic at the bar. It just seems to be a generation thing. And, um, you know, that really Coke is really the one that's that's caused the problem. And it's funny, the heroin dealers here, there is a particular gang that supply the heroin and they're vicious and ruthless, but they avoid conflict and feuds. Whereas the cocaine gangs, because I think they're all so young, inexperienced and hot headed, they're all killing one another. I mean, there's they're fighting for every little bit of turf. And they're they're just feuding. They're they're feuding to such an extent you can't keep up with them. You don't know who's who or who's on which side. And it's all cocaine driven. The shootings and the um, look, firearms come in with the, the drugs. It's like a cherry on top. The same same load is coming in with with a huge amount of firearms. Every of they all have guns. The the young kids on the bikes delivering the drugs up to people. You know, everybody has guns. They're so easy to come by. Um, but we're still really, 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 really far behind you guys, thankfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, a, lo a long way. But these things, you know, you have to keep uh, an eye on these things. Um, and it's, it kind of speaks a little bit, I think, this story to the kind of crazy place the world is in right now. Um, mm. And you have, I mean, capitalism, business is just in such a kind of crazy phase uh, gambling um, and, and Ireland's a big player. You know, Paddy Power is a is a mm. big that. You know, I've made a few bets <laughs> with them myself uh, on various things. I normally lose, but like um, the uh, I mean, you know, gambling's huge. The growth of casinos is really massive, um, and this kind of weird thing where uh, these gangsters are these you know these anti heroes, but this kind of big thing, and then bring into kind of sports and this kind of weird. Um, I guess, I guess, you know, it sounds a bit conservative, but lack of values. Um, mm -hmm. um, it, it is kind of big in society. It does kind of speak to that in a way as well. It's kind of weird, inverted kind of way that things have gone with this, where you have a this crime family and this massive, mm. insane amounts of money and all of this stuff. But at the same time, you do have, I mean, like I say, I, I mean, Tyson Fury, I think, is a very inspirational figure to lots of people. Um, I think he is somebody who, people who have been down in the dumps and seeing the way you can come back and kind of beat, you know, that kind of mental perseverance. And he is also preaching religious kind of God stuff as well, um, which is not a bad thing, I think, in a way. So kind of this, a lot of different angles there kind of to make sense of. Mm -hmm. There is. And look, it's not surprising, really, that the gangsters are interested in sport, is it? Because there's so much money in it and they mm -hmm. have they're making so much money. I mean, they are awash with money, gangsters. Now, actually, you never kind of, is it real though? Can they touch it? You always hear that they have, you know, they've, uh, you know, they've made hundreds of thousands and this and that and the other. And actually, when they're caught, they don't seem to have a seat in their pants. Mm. They always seem to it seems to disappear the money or something. It just seems to they spend it very badly. I mean, here actually in Ireland, we there was a, a journalist murdered, a crime journalist murdered some years ago, and. Um, it was horrendous, but it was a, a, a drug dealer ordered her execution. And it was probably the first in Europe that we had. And um, it resulted in a huge, um, you know, it was a kind of a watershed moment in Ireland, really. And they it resulted in bringing in of legislation to form a thing called the Criminal Assets Bureau. And it was one of the first in Europe, actually. And it became the blueprint for you know, lots of other countries, including there was a delegation from Malta only over recently to, to look at our, our legislation. Um, but it's been brilliant because they can't spend their money or else the assets are taken from them. 
they have to prove, by the way, how the onus of proof is on them, it was quite draconian legislation and I think was only brought in because the nation was so horrified by what had happened. But the onus is on them to prove how they legitimately earned the money to be able to afford the large Mercedes and the seven houses down the country. Um, so it can be amusing and interesting to go into the courts and watch it play out as they try desperately to claim that they betted on, on the horse. They had a few good days in Paddy Power, unlike yourself, and, um, you know, <laughs> that they actually own these things. But it's a fantastic um, arm of the law to have because, mm. you know, I think for communities in particular and, and, and they've brought the value down for the Criminal Assets Bureau to be able to go in on, on, on and seize items to 5,000. So, you know, even within small communities where, where they've been ravaged by drugs or whatever, and the local drug dealer might have, starting off, he might have a little bit of a car, not, you know, 30 grand's worth. They can go in and take it. If his car is worth six grand, they can go in and take it. And it's not the value of it, because that's nothing in, in the greater fight against crime. But I think it's a brilliant sort of a, a, an optical thing for communities to see them being stripped of those things you know you're bringing kids up in an area and they're in the second hand football runners but the drug dealers kids are in the best and and you know they've better than you for everything it's very difficult to bring kids up in areas like that i think i admire yeah. people who do yeah i mean i mean with the, with the money thing you're saying i mean it's, it's drug money is a funny thing and and, and i talk to cousins of el, el chapo you talk about this and it's like well you're making a lot of money but you're spending a lot of, mo a lot of money. Mm, mm. I talked to the son of Pablo Escobar. Uh, he said, you know, people were saying that his father was worth billions. When they actually his father died, he said that they looked around and got about $220 million they found of assets. So a lot less than people were saying, and they just got that to pay off, you know, what everybody, all the money everyone was asking for. Mm -hmm. So that money is uh, deceptive or, or it's kind of a lot of money, is, a lot of drug dealing is based on somebody giving you a bunch of drugs and you owe them money, but somebody owes yes. you money. It's kind of a um, bit like journalism. I mean, you know, people owe us money. <laughs> you know, Always. Yeah, we're broke. Yeah. Um, so just the last question and to finish off, I mean, it's, it's an amazing story. It really deserves some attention. And it, it's great to see uh, journalists covering this stuff because a lot of the time you get these crazy crime stories happening and there's no journalists there covering them. There's mm. no there digging this stuff up and it's a it's a tough old beat. Um this one being in, in Dublin and, and and you know like uh facing off you know people with all this kind of money. So it's great the newspaper has supported you with this investigations and uh, it'd be great for people to follow this investigations, read up, uh look at where it's happening and you know how American and British newspapers are picking this up, but go to the original source Mm -hmm. uh, they're an island. But like a last question, I mean, how are you, how do this all play out and what's going to be a happy end to you this story? Well, to be honest with you, this story is, I mean, to me, it's still playing out and every sort of couple of days, there seems to be new news from people that you never thought. we're going to be talking there at all because um, there's just been a lot of people who've lost their lives and there's a lot of kids who've lost parents um, as a result of the greed surrounding this um, whole thing. So I don't know. I mean, I certainly would. I certainly would like to see Tyson Fury fight Anthony Joshua. I wouldn't like to be in any way, shape or form considered even a teeny weeny bit responsible for that not happening. But I, I, I would like to see maybe, you know, I don't like to see the likes of an organised crime gang being that heavily involved in any sport. I just think it's wrong. I just, my moral compass is spinning off the charts here with this. OK, well, let's see then. So uh, let's see what happens with this uh, crazy story. Um, so, yeah, keep on following, you know, your work. You know, you'll find your work um, on the website. I mean, a lot is still a generally a printed newspaper there's still a good uh yeah reading newspapers still in dublin but uh but you can find your stuff online as well and you can see you on twitter um you, you haven't got any book in the works on this as well um any well maybe books? yeah something that i suppose really should get me i'm actually i have i just got a book coming out in september on a, a sort of a gangland story as well but um 
I'll just get that out and then move on. A bit lazy with the old books. Okay. <laughs> Unlike well, yourself, I noticed. Okay. Yep. Well, um, great chatting to you, and uh, yeah, keep on following this this story. <laughs>